I'll wait for him to come in. We're broadcasting live. There is no such thing as wait. Go ahead. Good evening. This is Mike Miller. I'm with the Link Local Network. We're here at the Morris Graduate School of Management in Schaumburg, Illinois, hosting manufacturing tools. What does an industrial engineer do? Before we get started, we'd like to thank some of the sponsors of the event, uh, including Royal Johnson B2B CFOs, Ann Potts, Executive Performance Fuel, Lori Husband, Valuable Resources Incorporated, and Fred McMurray with Manditech LLC. So as I like to introduce our uh, presenter, Marty Rosenblum. He's been an industrial engineer for many years. He's been both associated with different manufacturing processes, including metalworking, electronics, assembly, metal finishing, and consulting. MBR Consulting has been managing business resources since 1987. Marty, welcome. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, thank you. Well, I get asked this question quite frequently, what does an industrial engineer do? Uh, a lot of times the answer isn't as simple as I would like it to be, because uh, people ask, don't know. And I guess essentially the best answer is that an industrial engineer uh, deals with people and any processes that people may have to deal with. An industrial engineers uh, usually find a better way to make a product faster and easier, a safer way, a less expensive way, and better ways to solve problems by analysis and uh, examination. A better way to make product faster and easier is either to use uh, machines to do what formerly was done by hand, and then also to maybe uh, move things around a little bit in the factory uh, so they're a little more efficient and working next to each other and, and better flowing of products. A safer way uh, is everything uh, is, is, is in such a way that people can't get hurt. We try to do it so it's uh, built into the operation and built into everything that they're doing, but we can't always do that. Sometimes people like to do unsafe practices, which we'll find out a little later on. Uh, so a less expensive way, which is always what we're looking for, to keep those costs down, uh, whether it's uh, labor costs, material costs, machine costs, anything within the factory, energy costs, everything that we can think of in a factory, uh, to keep those costs down. Uh, better ways to solve the problem by analysis and examination is checking all kinds of reports, uh, see where bottlenecks are at, uh, and then take a look at those bottlenecks and determine what has to be done uh, to free that up so that you have a complete flow of product going through uh, nicely and smoothly. Industrial engineers uh, utilize people, machines, materials, information, and energy. Uh, people are the lifeblood of anything that goes on in the factory. Everything that you're doing is related to people. Uh, all the operators, all the machines, somebody has to operate, whether it's a, a CNC machine or it's a manual machine, somebody has to be there to do something with it to make it work. All the different machines, try to use machines uh, to utilize whatever uh, products has to be made to make it uh, faster and smoother and easier and also less dangerous because machines can do it uh, better and more consistently than humans usually can. Uh, the materials, well, what materials are we using to build whatever our product is? Uh, materials can change, sometimes the materials can change uh, to different materials from what was specified originally uh, because we find out that uh, the original isn't doing what we want it to do or it's a little too expensive. Uh, vendors are charging us too much. So we want to come in with something a little bit less uh, expensive and keep the cost down, but still maintain the integrity of the product. Information, uh, we're looking for uh, whatever information we can get from the factory floor and tell us uh, how everybody is doing, what we're doing towards expectations. Uh, is the product being de delivered on a, on a timely basis? Is it going from station to station on a timely basis? And what about uh, our, our customers? Are we delivering to them on a timely basis? Uh, the energy, we want to keep the energy in the factory, whether it's electric or gas, uh, to an absolute minimum. Uh, if we are looking for a new place to build, we want to make sure that uh, the energy that we need is available uh, 
to be used, be used by this particular new factory. Traditionally, uh, IE tasks include efficiency improvements, time studies, factory layouts, uh, process engineering, uh, cost estimating, production standards, uh, establishing quality control plan, forecasting, uh, production control, and safety. We're always going to talk about safety. Efficiency improvements have to do with uh, each area in a factory, whether or not the products are next to each other, where they're located, uh, so the operator has ease, ease of use uh, at their workstation. Uh, the time studies are the building blocks for everything. The amount of time that it takes to develop a product at each workstation, add it up with all of them, equals what the co total cost of the product would be, uh, so the cost accountants can figure out uh, what kind of pricing we're going to be doing on that particular product, along with the materials. Factory layouts, uh, we're trying to keep it so that the operations are in a sequential mode, going from uh, one operation to the next operation, in a short distance, we want to keep everything relatively close to each other. We want to make sure uh, that the material handling is done properly, and we can also have them done on a timely basis. Everything is done on a timely basis. It doesn't do any good to have anything waiting for somebody else to uh, move it to another station when they're waiting for work. Uh, the cost estimating is, yeah, the process engineering and the cost estimating will go together. Uh, at the beginning of a project to determine uh, what the sequence of events should be on a new product and therefore what tooling is necessary, uh, what workstations are necessary, what machines are necessary, uh, what people are necessary, and then therefore uh, the manpower. Cost estimating ties in with all of that and we can figure out uh, or at least estimate what the cost of a product would be based on what we come up with in our process engineering. Uh, we want to follow that through uh, once we're into production to make see how close we were and just uh, make sure that we're not deviating too much. If we are, why? So that's just a it's just a, a benchmark that we can use as the product is going through the factory. Uh, the production standards would tell everybody uh, what is necessary, what we would expect from everybody at a finished product at each workstation and uh, how long it should take at each workstation. The established quality control plan, we want to make sure that along the way everything is, uh, all the quality control stops along the way are followed through, uh, adhered to, and that they're pertinent and necessary for whatever we're looking at and doing. Uh, as we go through all of this on the quality control, we can then add in our Six Sigma and make sure that we are uh, keeping our mistakes down to a minimum. We want to get to that 0 .004 uh, mistake uh, percentage. Uh, forecasting, we try to figure out uh, what we're going to be selling, how much we're going to be selling, and what the product mix will be. And therefore, we can also tie into what our manpower should be, uh, what machine we need, and then also comes into play uh, if our layout is correct and any other uh, manufacturing operations are, are tied into that. Uh, production control, make sure that uh, we have enough material on hand to do the job, what it's supposed to be done, and that we can ship to our uh, uh, customers at the time that they want the product being delivered to them. Uh, so we have to end the, therefore, all the machines are, are working, all the operators are on hand. Uh, the sequence of events can be had. If we have a machine down, we have an alternate machine that we can go to and just make sure that the product gets to our customer uh, when they need it. Uh, safety. We can build in all the safety that we want. Machine guarding, we can put in one way or the other, whether it's a laser to break the, uh, the circuit, stop the machine from working, to drop down the glass, uh, or plexiglass, uh, pullbacks, whatever. We can have all kinds of safety on there, uh, but they have to be used. So it's up to management to make sure that every operator at every station where safety is a requirement 
they're being utilized. Safety glasses are, are used where they're supposed to be used. Face shields, if they need it, are, they, are being used. Uh, hearing protection, if necessary. Anything that has to be done uh, safety-wise. The task of a workplace layout, we want to make sure that uh, all supplies, and supplies could be raw materials, uh, nuts and bolts, any kind of fasteners, uh, are located where they're supposed to be. Uh, we want to make sure that if we're doing a two-handed operation, which is an efficient way of doing it, we want to make sure that the products that are supposed to be done with the right hand are on the right side, and those by the left hand are on the left side, and that the operator uh, can put together parts together uh, without having to cross over and keeping uh, distance to reach everything at an absolute minimum. Uh, timely refills. Uh, somebody has to make sure that all the parts are refilled in any bins that they might have, uh, if, whether it's fasteners, actual raw material, what have you, uh, on a timely basis. Uh, we don't want any operator standing around waiting for parts. Uh, that's the bottleneck that we want to look for in a factory and make sure that doesn't occur. So that has to do with material handlers have to do their job on a timely basis. So timely is a very good, very good benchmark for everything that we do. We want everything on time uh, when it's expected. Timely removal, that means that when the part is finished at whatever the workstation is and becomes work in process, it's either moved to the next workstation, which would be ideal, or into a work, work in process inventory uh, if we're not ready to go to the next station, which we shouldn't be, but we should be doing everything all the way straight through. Uh, ergonomics, we want to make sure the operators uh, aren't injuring themselves in any way, shape, or form. We don't want any carpal tunnel syndrome. We don't want anybody uh, doing anything that's going to be uncomfortable, uh, take longer breaks than they're supposed to take because they're in pain or some such thing like that. So everything is ergonomically uh, done as best as possibly can be done at uh, today's market. Now the proper tools, I want to make sure that if they're hammering something in, they actually have a hammer, not the end of a screwdriver. So anything that they're doing, if they can have something, an air driver, if they can have a pneumatic something or other, uh, use that as opposed to a hand tool. So anything that's going to be done faster and easier and makes it easier for the operator and less stressful, less, therefore less painful for them. If anybody has any questions, you know, just, just jump right in and ask. Where do you typically find the biggest opportunities in those categories? Actually, material handling is a big thing. Most people overlook. Everybody likes to pay attention to the uh, operation, but everybody seems to forget material handling. And we've got to get the material handlers doing their job doing it properly and, and also using the proper equipment to get the material to the operator so they know that they are doing the right job. So if what type of return if the, you got the material handlers working correctly as you put it, what type of percentage increase do you normally see of improvement? What you'll normally get, uh, the question is uh, what type of an increase do you get uh, using material handlers and doing material handlers properly. You, you will find that the operators that were standing around waiting cease to exist. Everybody is going to be doing their job continuously and with a uh, good skill and good effort, which is always necessary for uh, factory operation. They'll have the parts available. They'll have the uh, finished product removed and free up the space for the next group of uh, finished products that you're coming up. Do you find a lot of resistance to implementing changes? No, most of the cha it, 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 resistance to changes comes from management, not from the operators. They're very flexible, and they'll do whatever is asked of them to do. And I think most people don't realize that the people on the factory floor want to do a good job. They want to get it done right, uh, but they want management also to take an interest in what they're doing and get it done right. Some of the tasks are time studies. That's the basis for everything. You know, you need to know uh, what, how long it takes to do an operation. Uh, there are a number of ways to 
figure that out. You can use a stopwatch, which is the, uh, the old-fashioned way, but it still does the job. It gets everything done properly uh, or a predetermined time, which means that uh, you use something similar to or the same as MTM, and there's some others out there too. It measures every finger squiggle that you use, every reach, gives you a chance to analyze what it is uh, that the operation entails. And then... What's yeah, MTM? Uh, motion time, uh, methods time uh, management. We haven't used MTM in about uh, 20 years. Oh, all right. But that is a way that you can use it. The differences are stopwatch. If the dollars don't matter all that much, you can use a stopwatch because they generally tend to be a little bit uh, more time involved than, than an MTM or any kind of predetermined time would be. If dollars matter significantly, then a predetermined time system uh, generally is called for. Uh, if, if it's very capital intensive, stopwatch, very labor intensive, uh, predetermined time. If we're paying incentive on a job, that means that you're paying the operator uh, dollars per piece that they're that they produce, or a percentage of their uh, hourly rate for what they're do producing. Uh, it could go either way with a stopwatch or a predetermined time. Generally speaking, uh, a lot of union contracts uh, allow for a specific uh, percentage that the operator can come up with, so you have to come up with that value. Stopwatches would allow that closer to it, and it doesn't usually cost the company more to do it that way. Predetermined times, again, come back in uh, when, when the dollars are extremely important. It, it, it's more labor intensive uh, than capital intensive. Uh, Non-incentive is like a day work operation. All you're really using it for is a measurement of manpower, how long it takes uh, to do a job, and how many people you're going to need. And it's more of an estimate. It's not not always adhered to, but that's management's responsibility to make sure that it is at least close to, to what it's supposed to be. Line balancing is if you are, have a, an operation that goes from one to another to another to another, uh, six, seven, eight stations, whatever it is, you'd like to have the time difference between each station between three and five percent. Obviously the optimum would be that each one is identical, but it's not always possible to do that. So you want them to be as close as possible, three to five percent difference between them. So there is no bottlenecks in the line. So go, the product goes from one end to the other end with nobody having to wait for anything. Uh, sometimes uh, when I've been called in, the first station is five minutes, the second station is a minute. So they're waiting four minutes for a part to come through to the second station. So you don't want that kind of situation to happen because uh, everybody down the line is just sitting there waiting uh, or helping out at the first station. Not a good situation. Uh, Establishing cost, the, the time value helps to establish the cost because you know how many minutes it takes to do a job and you can base that on the hourly rate uh, either from the contract or what the operation or the operator will be being paid to do a job. Mark, could you talk a little more about predetermined time and what you mean by that? Predetermined and why it would be used in the more labor intensive or cost mattering situation. Okay. The question is, uh, what about the predetermined time, a little bit more about it, and why it would be used on a uh, more labor-intensive operation? Because predetermined time has a time value for every single uh, finger movement, hand movement, arm movement, body movement uh, that's, that an operator can make. Uh, so and it's broken down into specific elements. Uh, so if I'm reaching to something, that's one thing. I want to grab a hold of it, that's one thing. And I want to bring it back, that's another opera, another value. And the time values have already been determined as to what they would be. So I would add all those times up, and that would be the predetermined time for that particular operation. Uh, there are some rules and regulations that you have to follow, whether or not the, the weight of the product is, uh, whether it's a dangerous product or not a dangerous product. And that helps you, too, when you're methodizing an operation because then you can see, if I'm reaching 12 inches to something, why isn't it six inches away? So that helps you to see that kind of thing to methodize an operation. You'd use that because in industrial engineering parlance, uh, 
the standard time that you come up with is tighter than a stopwatch would be. Uh, by that I mean a stopwatch takes into effect any movement that an operator can make, whether it's extraneous or necessary, and then the predetermined time says it's going to take this much time to do it, and that's it. So uh, on the stopwatch, so we get back to that, uh, we do what we call judgment leveling. So if I see an operator that is, is uh, doing an operation and I will see some extraneous movements going on, I can factor those out of there and bring it down closer to the predetermined time, but generally speaking, it's still going to be a little bit looser than a predetermined time. Of the factory layout, I want to make sure that all the operations, whether they're machines, man, man, man uh, operator operate, operations, or whatever they are, they're sequential. We want to go from one to the other to the other, and we want to make sure that there's nothing in between. We don't want to go from here to here, back to here. It's just too much time involved to do that, and it's very inefficient to do that. Uh, the material handling, get back to our material handling, we want to make sure that the material handlers uh, are watching their particular operations and keeping the operators uh, filled with parts, filled with raw material, and anything else that they might need to get their operation done uh, without them having to stand around and wait. We'd like to have the uh, raw material uh, stationed someplace relatively close to where the operations would be so they don't have to go from here back to here back to here again uh, filling up an operator with raw material. Uh, same thing with when we're finished with the product we don't want to have to go from here to here back to here again when we're going to ship something out the door. So we want to have everything in a sequential fashion uh, within the building uh, so it can be done smoothly and easily. Uh, the outgoing finished products we want to make sure uh, that the staging areas are near the trucks or wherever they're going to be. We try to keep the uh, rump finished goods material inventory down to a minimum. We don't want to keep that's a lot of dollars sitting on on the shelving, uh, doing nothing, collecting dust. Some opera, some some uh, consumer products will do that kind of thing. They'll have raw material, uh, but if we're doing something between two uh, factories, going from one factory to another factory, we're supplying them. Uh, we want to try and keep it so we're going uh, just in time. We'll, we'll right, from, right from the finish line to the to the truck, yes. Have you got any um, like case studies or, or examples of what you're talking about, companies that didn't do it right and, and what happened to them? The question is uh, if I had any case studies of uh, any, any companies that didn't do it that way and what happened to them. Generally speaking, if they don't do that and they put things up, finished goods on a shelf uh, somewhere in the back of the factory. Uh, I have found that a number of those places the products have become obsolete and they now have to turn around and sell those products at a reduced cost just to get them out of their factory. Uh, and they don't make any money. So that's been sitting there, all the dollars have been sitting there on the shelf doing nothing, collecting dust, and then they have to turn around and sell it because it's now obsolete. Those that put it right and go from the packing line to the truck uh, end up having the best operation. One, number one, it's a smaller factory. You don't need the shelving for the finished goods, so you can have less square footage on the floor. And then the proper spacing. There's one, one thing we want to do when we're laying that, I hope that answers your question. When we're, when we're doing a factory layout, we'd like to make sure that the spacing on the floor is adequate. We want to make sure that we can move between operations easily and smoothly. Uh, we don't want somebody being in the way. We don't want things in the middle of the floor uh, to slow down our forklift operators or whoever, whatever else we're using for material handling. So everything, the old saying, the old industrial engineering saying, is a place for everything and everything in its place. We like to keep it that way. Safety. We want to keep the uh, machines guarded. Whatever the machine is, uh, we want to make sure that we have some kind of guarding on there so operators will not get hurt. Uh, if it's a punch press, we want to make sure that their hands cannot enter the punch area when the machine is being activated. Uh, 
range from the old way of just having uh, pullbacks on the hand to go back when it goes when the machine uh, is pressing, or uh, we have a plexiglass shield that can come down and block the, the uh, entryway for the for the punch press, or maybe even a laser beam if your hand breaks that uh, beam, the machine is uh, inoperative. So it can't be done. Whatever it is and whatever it takes to guard the machine, we should have that in place. Um, I've seen too many fingers disappear from punch press operations. A forklift trainer, very essential. We can't have just somebody driving a forklift. They need to know exactly how to drive that forklift within the factory. We don't want to skewer anybody with the forks on there. Yes? I was at a plant where the forklift driver actually ran over himself. <laughs> That's pretty <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, he actually he actually ran over himself, and it wasn't me. Um, but did he ruin the forklift? Um, actually, he did a bit of damage to it. Um, he got hurt. Um, I think they burnt out a motor um, on the forklift. Um, now, it's, now you know why it's necessary to have proper training on how to use the forklift. Also, if the forks are going up, you want to make sure that the weight on there is such that the forklift isn't going to tip over because it's now uh, out of balance. The center, the center of gravity is, hasn't shifted in such a way that the forklift truck falls over. Uh, safety equipment. We have other safety equipment that we will need throughout the factory. Uh, depending if you're handling hot steel, you want to have the proper gloves on, maybe a face shield uh, to keep from getting uh, hot sparks going <coughs> flying into you if you're running a forging operation. Ouch. Ouch, yes. The steel is heated up to 2300 mm -hmm. degrees. You want to make sure that the, the, the steel that's coming at you is, you're protected from it. Uh, you want to have the proper tools for the job. If you're putting in, the, you're screwing something in, you don't want to have to add a hand screw because number one, you're going to end up with your carpal tunnel on there. So you want to have a pneumatic drill, a pneumatic screwdrivers, uh, any any other operate, any other tools that you need. Make sure that they're the proper ones. You want to, you don't want uh, anybody getting hurt, and you also don't want to break the tools and have something go flying. People have been using screwdriver handles for hammers for I don't know how long, and plastic goes flying in all directions. Uh, later on, after it's been used for quite a while. So if you're going to do any hammering, get a hammer. You know? uh, I'd rather have a screwdriver to get hammered, though. Well, the hammer's not going to fly off. And go off. I'd rather get hammered. The screwdriver isn't going to fly off. I got it. Right? I got it, too. The insurance uh, studies show that uh, it pays to be safe. You know, it's good. You're going to save about $3 for every dollar that you invest in, pre in prevention. And that's going to come because you don't have uh, workers who don't come in because they're hurt. You don't have claims that you have to, that you have to pay, and you can comes back in the form of lower premium. So it's it pays to be safe uh, and use the safe safe uh, tools, equipment, get the training, and the guardian. Okay. One other thing, when you're doing your uh, the safety. We can put all this safety in, in place, have all the up-to-date safety equipment, everything is nice and, nice and uh, up-to-date, and, and, and you have some operator who decides that uh, it doesn't apply to me. I can do whatever I want to do, and I can do an unsafe operation. So I'm going to show you a couple of things here. Signs <laughs> like this, while they're good now, become invisible after a while. You don't see them. So you need to keep reminding everybody uh, that safe practices are the, the uh, mode of the day. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Mr. Brown said, yes. We used cattle prods to make sure compliance came through. There Just you go. Here. <laughs> you know where I've been some of the places, so that makes sense to you. The comment is that we would use cattle prods to make sure everybody is safe. <laughs> <laughs> now this is how this is a, how signs. Uh, nobody pays attention. Do not climb, play on, or in a round pipe. And everybody saw that sign when they went onto this pipe, <laughs> but with, with the crowd out here. So signs become invisible after a while. You just don't see them anymore. 
like I said, you would zap one of those kids with the cattle prod, all the rest of them would be jump. like, a bunch of guys with a They ain't got yeah, well, that much They won't have to worry about it anymore. Another unsafe practice in a factory. Standing on the top of a rounded trash container to hang a sign. See, that's the safety sign. <laughs> that's the safety <laughs> sign. That was the safety <laughs> sign. All right, now, before you do anything on this one, this personifies everything that we talked about in unsafe practices uh, in a factory. We'll see a forklift driver. We're going to see, I don't know if you can see it just yet, forklift driver. We're going to see a plant layout that uh, doesn't work. We're going to see things that aren't where they're supposed to be, and uh, click on it. No, no, oh, you sorry. It's going to cancel. Get the mouse on, the, on there and click on it. Just click on the picture. Is that it's, it's set up as a left. No. no. <laughs> oh. I will have to get this one operating and we'll through it this whole thing so you can see this in action over here. It is very memorable and you will enjoy it. <laughs> and you will also know what not to do. Do you think if I go on a slideshow do it maybe? No. Okay. I'll get to, we'll get to it. Okay. And what does an industrial engineer do? An industrial engineer will be involved in every facet of manufacturing and operation. Every, anything and everything that has to do with manufacturing uh, will include an industrial engineer. Uh, industrial engineer may be involved in other facets of manufacturing operations. Cost accounting, certainly we, we end up uh, putting the cost together, uh, whether it's the prime cost, whether it's uh, labor or whether it's material or both, and how much a product costs. Purchasing, we work with the purchasing department to be able to bring in the proper uh, material, equipment, uh, packing materials, uh, fasteners, anything that might be necessary to get the product out. HR have gone and handled grievances with the union and the operators, uh, so, and also have done, end up doing other HR work within the factory. Uh, job descriptions. Contract negotiation, can sit in on contract negotiations and help and determine some of the language within the contract. Project management, uh, anything that, any kind of projects that a factory has and has to get done, needs somebody to go ahead and do it, and that's be an industrial engineer because they would have to handle it. If it has to do with IT, it has to do with operations, and maybe it has to do with uh, the production, we would have the industrial engineers being the liaison for, for that and anything else. We do anything else that management deems has to be done in a factory falls upon the industrial engineer uh, to do it. Standing on round of trash cans. Standing on the trash cans and with the net. <laughs> Somebody has to do that. So, any questions, comments, discussions? And I've got to go back and I'll show you that. How are you involved with HR? I have done personally. I have handled union grievances. I have uh, gone in there and done some job descriptions, done payroll, created payroll as a project actually, it was a payroll project. Uh, so yeah, I get involved reporting, any kind of reports uh, that may be necessary for, uh, the, for the factory to get the project product out the door, uh, whether it's production reports, dollar reports, how much they're making, if they're on incentive, if they are over incentive, under incentive, if everybody is over incentive, they're making well over 100%, the cost of the product remains the same. If they go under 100%, then the cost of the product goes up. So I have to watch and make sure that everybody stays over 100% on an incentive factory. Uh, so we keep the costs, what the standard cost should be. Yes? So what's the most interesting industry that you've been involved in? Other than a trip to the southern Illinois with you. <laughs> Which trip? Pig farm. Oh my. Yes. Wasn't a farm. No, it was, wasn't a farm. Uh, I had a project uh, myself one time. Uh, the Panasonic, naming names, called me in 
uh, to go to Motorola because they had sold them some equipment and Motorola was not using the equipment properly. And they wanted me to report back uh, what was going on. That was kind of fascinating to go in there, listening to them on the one side, complaining and seeing that what they're doing wrong, and then having to report back to the other one. I had another project that took two years in the making. I was on an airplane every week, every, so every Monday and uh, Friday for two years, uh, on a payroll project. We automated the payroll uh, using uh, barcodes. And so we had to set up their mainframe computer, which was an AS400, and get that working properly, and to program the uh, scanners that everybody used. Every operator had a handheld scanner, and we had to tie it in uh, with the PC. I wanted to go live with it. They didn't. They wanted to download it, and I, they ultimately went out. But then they were sorry they did. They should have gone live. So what was your most sleep-inducing um, client? <laughs> the sleep-inducing <laughs> one, unfortunately, is anyone that has to do with time study. You can watching other which this, industry? Any industry. If you're watching somebody work, he it said sounds good. Mattresses. <laughs> it sounds good. I know. It, it sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> However, that wasn't the, mo the, the, the most sleep inducing. But it was the most comfortable. <laughs> it was the most comfortable. Yes. Marty, what trends have you seen over the last twenty? Uh, 23 from 87 till now. Supposed to be 1887. Okay, 100 point years. Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The electricity for what? You look real good for it. Thank you. I was born February 29th, so it's every, I only have my birthday every four years. What do you think well, is the Biggest trend since the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what the question was. No, the question in industrial it's engineering. A wheel. What have you, you know, I've, you know, my own experience has been, you know, lean has come along. Yes. Yeah. Those things have come along. Yes. The cell phones, um, the well, whole concept, the Six Sigma. Every, all all the other uh, Japanese terms, the Six Sigma, the Kaizen. I know you didn't mention many of those. I know, I can get into that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, with the PDAs using that, uh, that becomes a better stopwatch using the PDA <laughs> than using the old stopwatch. Uh, so, you know, a lot of uh, innovations within the shop itself, uh, machining, uh, machines that do multiple operations, not just one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love the, the quiver of fear. And, and what do you think the effect of social media will have on industrial engineering? How will social media in itself and the, the, the rapid transactions or communications that happen, how will that affect industrial engineering? I don't know if it will have a, a direct bearing on industrial engineering as such. However, it probably will help individuals who have specific situations uh, that maybe they've never encountered before or some other situations that some other people have, and just a, an exchange of ideas and an exchange of uh, answers for questions. I don't know that it would have a specific. Do you have another? Do you have a differing opinion? <laughs> Me? No. I got no opinion. Uh, so, how does an industrial engineer go and build his business? Who are you looking, who do you normally look to find? I look to find. Uh, for myself, a small company that has no industrial engineer on staff. Uh, they generally like to utilize uh, floor personnel to do something uh, that would be industrial engineering related, such as a factory layout, uh, such as trying to uh, determine times of each operation, uh, just uh, anything of, of that nature, because uh, those people usually can't do the job properly need somebody to come in who has done this before. You know, back to the back to the time study, uh, I used to work at a production machine shop and we had machines that would cycle and it could keep running if you kept them fed with parts. So I think that in that case the stopwatch is a better indicator of you know cycle time and everything. 
I think with Dirk, and then the uh, the other one would be more if you were just working on something individually and not and not having a machine run during during that time. On the ones with the uh, machines, if somebody is uh, watching more than one machine, uh, they have what they call a multiple machine complement, and you want to know how many machines uh, can one person handle before a machine is sitting idle and just waiting for him. So you want to try and get to the point where you're going in your circle and machines are, are idle for an absolute minimum amount of time. Yeah. If, if they're, they have to be because you have a load and unload. So you want to keep it down to a, an absolute minimum. And there are a mathematical formula that you can use uh, to, to calculate that. Yeah, we had a work cell where we had two people running three machines and were able to keep up with that. It's kind of interesting. Well, generally speaking, you probably have one person running the three machines if you could, could do that and, and do, it, do it properly. The machine does what it's supposed to do and you keep that load and unload time just to that load and unload. Along the lines of what Fred was asking about social media and happening, today I had an email that asked me what smartphone I use from one of the lean consultancies. Um, and the implication was that they were looking to create some widgets and apps um, for smartphones and whatever type thing to be right at your back and cough like you just pulled, like Marty pulled it well, up. Well, there are there are companies out there who already have time study apps right. that you can put on your uh, PDA. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of them that advertise in Industrial Engineering Magazine. Uh, so, yeah, and I've had one previously when I had a phone. So yeah, there are apps out there to do just that. I want to create my own. I see a hand going up. So you mentioned the steel industry earlier. Yes. And um, you have experience in dealing with the, were they local steel manufacturers? Were they overseas? Were they, um, and what did you do? The, one of the local companies that I dealt with on a, in steel was a forging operation. Uh, they did the forging here. I don't want to say it was overseas, it wasn't Kansas. Uh, so we imported this uh, products from Kansas. Uh, and and the, the, the forging, machining, and everything else was done here in Chicago. The, metal, the finishing, heat treating, uh, even in some cases, uh, plasticizing, plasticizing the handles, they were all done here in Chicago. Are they still around? Yes. Do you, I'd like to talk to them if I could. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen them in a long time. Okay. But we can talk. Oh. And would, would you get involved as you're you know, working on one of these projects? Would you then like using, you know, the steel you said, you know, the forging was done locally, the machine was done locally, and this was all by one company that was doing this. If you found out, or if you got in there and you got involved, one of the things that you would be doing would be perhaps recommending outsourcing some of the processes because you, you were finding that it would be more cost effective or expedient for them to do so. I haven't found too much outsourcing that would be cost effective. Uh, a lot of times, if you can't make your own product, I mean, you have no business being in that business, you want to be able, sometimes you do have to import from Kansas regular you know parts that you might need uh, this particular company did have some zinc parts that they weren't capable of producing themselves but they bought them locally and they were just bought you know, as, as a completed product and then they just did whatever they had to do to finish up on there uh, they would not generally speaking they did not outsource and then, <coughs> then the, if that if they did which will be the exception not the rule is because the demand was higher than they were capable of handling in their particular facility, but it would still be outsourced to a local company. So given the comment you made about outsourcing yes. and making your own product, yes. why do you think so much of it's going on? I think a lot of that is people are doing that without thinking about it. They're just following uh, somebody else's lead because they think if they're doing it, we got to do it. I was talking earlier. Think, I think that uh, if something is capital intensive, I don't think it's really worthwhile doing it offshore. And labor intensive, 
Uh, the only the only thing that I can see that might be uh, outsourced, and I don't like it, but it's there, and that's call centers because it's all labor. You know, but anything that's that's capital intensive, uh, I can't see how you're saving money by doing it uh, offshore. I know of some companies that uh, ship raw material across the seas to get it done, and then they have to pay to come back again. I had inquired about a year or so ago what the cost of a container was for somebody who's in that in the, the logistics industry, and they told me a 40-footer uh, could be about $3,500. So that's twice that you're doing $3,500. Whether it's full or not is another question. And then also the shipping lines last year cut back by 20%, which means it has 20% less containers than you can do, that you did have. So unless your name is uh, Walmart, you're probably not getting a good deal on shipping any longer. Have you gotten involved in any studies of bring something back? That no, I, would, I haven't, but I wish I would. Yeah. I would like to. Yeah. I would like Let's to see do what that, that does. <laughs> Let's go get it, Marty. <laughs> I'd like to show you that one video that we did. Go back out to the uh, Windows Explorer and go to my I've hit about four clips that knocked the bolts yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. they didn't fall out loosely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so this this violated every safety rule that we can possibly think of. The aisle was too narrow. There was product sticking out into the aisle that shouldn't have been. The forklift operator should never have even tried to go through there. And as you, I don't know if you noticed it, but as he went through, his loads shifted on there uh, because he was trying to go through sideways and just barely made it. He cut him. A stanchion on the load was balanced, either. yeah. And he kept on going, and that's what pushed the stanchion out of the way. Jeez, that's oh, hard to run. run. <laughs> You're safer on the floor. Well, you get the cage, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's safer there supposed. until management comes out. That's, just, <laughs> that's why he was running. Now it's yeah. not safe. You know, <laughs> the, the plant man door was right in the direction he was headed, okay. <laughs> He was late for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing. I mean, yeah, I had something fall from you know a couple stories high onto a forklift, but you just watch it, it just comes yeah. down, hits the top, yeah. and you're you're safe. But yeah, well, this one. Uh, oh. Oh. So, oh, whatever was on there on those shelves, I don't know what what was on there. I can guess, but I'm not oh. sure. Uh, Any other? Good loss. What else do you have for us, Lori? <laughs> How about No, unfortunately, that's the only video I have. It's the only video you can show them. That's right. Well, that's right. That's right. Yeah, especially if we're going to be streaming live. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Jim, you missed that. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marty.
but particularly enjoy the movie. <laughs> Everybody yeah, bar, bring it back so we can see it. I will do so. All right. Uh, just a few notes we'd like to point out, and there would be additional events the Link Local Network is sponsoring. And one of them would be next Tuesday morning, March 1st, from 7.30 to 9 o'clock, if Caffeinated Connections in Schaumburg, right here at the Morris Graduate School of Management in Schaumburg. And it's a terrific way to get your month started, as well as meeting a lot of uh, small business owners or business owners in general. Uh, next Wednesday, March 2nd, from 2 to 5 in the afternoon, it's the second in a series of 14 social media semester classes that will be held at the C English Academy in Schaumburg. You can sign up for the classes via our website at www.lakelocalnetwork.com. And Tuesday, March 8th, 5.30, right here at the Morris Graduate School of Management, 16 Secrets for the Economic Recovery, Recovery it's a seminar series. This is the second session that we're repeating from the downtown because of the response with Jim Trelevin and Steve Greenberg. The content is absolutely great. It should be a must-see if you own or operate a business. So this is Mike Bowler at the Link Local Network reminding you to link locally and connect globally. We'll see you at the next event.